Today we're looking at the Sumo Light 100 Plus. It's a new lighting fixture from the Berlin-based manufacturer Sumo Light, and it's a fairly interesting device. It's fully passive, it's a panel-based LED, and it's also just two kilograms. That makes it very useful for rigging overhead, uh, and we're going to be using it as a top light today, mounted on a light boom. With me are Hans, who will be manning the camera and taking pictures, and Olga, who will be our model for today. So, let's take a look. Now I have to say that the Sumo 100 Plus is simply a lot of fun to use. Uh, in this scenario, we use it as a top light. Uh, we're reminded on a small light boom uh, because of its light weight of about two kilograms. It's easy to counterbalance. And we use some dead lights for some kickers uh, and some backlights. Um, we had our model, Olga, sit on the floor, uh, not only so we can uh, have an interesting look, but it also helps in these kind of scenarios to control a little bit of a spill since it's not too big of a studio. But first, some of the technical bits. We did some quick lighting quality measurements. So you get about a CRI of 93 for daylight and 95 for tungsten, which really is on par with uh, most other manufacturers. Uh, of course, you can go higher and in the coming years, uh, quality will certainly go up. But you have to wonder if we're not really reaching the point already where it's good enough. Um, I think that certainly this light quality will stay relevant for some time. Um, and as well, if you're taking a look at the build quality of this fixture, it's really very high. Uh, it makes for a very sleek and sexy looking uh, fixture, which is of course also a plus, but I think this will definitely translate in a very long durability of this fixture. When you compare this fixture to some of the other options out there, you, for example, uh, the Light Panels Astra is still very popular. Uh, this fixture does come in at, at a premium of about 500 to 600 euros. And so you have to consider that, is it worth it? Uh, the light output is slightly higher, and I think the light quality is comparable, but you do pay a little bit more. And um, I do think that is worth it. As you can see that I'm, I'm simply hand holding it here. Not a problem at all, it's very light. And, I couldn't feel any signs of fatigue um, and it makes for some very stunning pictures as well. You know, black and white really does well in this kind of uh, situation. And I think it does inspire a little bit more confidence than some of the other fixtures I've used with, which are just plasticky um, and often uh, active cooling. Whereas this uh, Sumo Light really has gone further out of fully passive. So there is a very nicely passive thin array on the backside of the unit. Uh, which looks cool. And I think overall this, this light really finds its niche as a sort of a go-to light for rigging. If you have an awkward place uh, where you want to have a light, uh, this can easily be battery powered. You have a lot of different light shaping options. Uh, you have a regular softbox, the lantern kit, uh, as well as an octagon. Uh, and I think the octagon might actually even be the most interesting option for this. Um, so in either case, do buy some kind of light shaping to go with this kit uh, because though you can use it as a hard light, it really does shine as a soft light. So far we've been using this as a soft light and I have to say that it's working quite well as a top light. Uh, all the buttons are feeling quite sturdy. Uh, and most surprisingly, under the current ambient temperature of about 25 degrees now, um, this light is really cool to the touch. It doesn't feel very warm at all. It may be maybe 10 degrees over, uh, over ambient. Um, so that is certainly a pleasing thing. So it, it tells me that this light fixture has been designed for tougher conditions than this. Um, so I think you would be happy to use this outside uh, under, uh, under summer conditions. Um, one thing to notice is that the skirts are very easy to put on and put off, but they do somewhat limit you in the range that you can tilt the, the fixture. Um, what you'll notice is that, well it's quite loose right now, um, is that tilting up of course is not a problem, but once you start to tilt down, uh, you'll notice that the skirt will start hitting uh, on the yoke. Um, the yoke has been um, quite nicely machined, um, but this is one of the downsides of it. They could have taken a little bit more space so you had more freedom. 
Um, but overall, I think they went for a design where they wanted to have a two kilogram fixture and they really stuck with it. Um, on the back side, we have a few basic controls. The on and off switch feels very nice and sturdy. We have the mix controls here, master slave setting, uh, as well as the end cap uh, for uh, DMX as well. Color temperature is adjustable with a slider. Uh, nice and solid, same goes for the intensity. You notice that it's not a stepless design, so there are a few steps as you go up. Uh, we have DMX in and out, and we have an XLR uh, cable for power. Um, if you notice, there are a few hard points where you can screw in a holder for the adapter, uh, as well as a holder for V-Log batteries. What you also notice is that there's a cross here and there is a Kinoflow style uh, ball mount here. So if you want to use this as a top light, probably the ball mount would be an even better choice uh, for that. So we're going to take off the skirt and turn this into a hard light. Put this away. This soft box comes folded up like this, it's a nice square. Inside are pieces of wire which form semicircles. Uh, you can pull them out and you have the two largest ones. Uh, and if you're standing in the back of the fixture, you want to make sure that the outer ones, the large ones, go outside of the fixture. And then you have these, the shorter ones, that go like so. It takes a bit getting used to, but the advantage is that it is self-supporting and once it's nicely in place, you can start popping the buttons. Some of them are easier than the others. Um, and you just work your way around. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but I think it's a fairly well-designed system. Um, and like so. There are a few pieces of Velcro here as well. Um, which you can take off, but I do find that they tend to um, come together out of themselves because the Velcro pieces are quite close together uh, and once you let go, uh, it's quite easy for them to reconnect. So that's that. Once you remove this, you can have a look at the face. So if we take a look at the front of the fixture, this is just for LEDs without lenses or a diffuser on, on the front, um, which is the way we've been using it with the softbox for maximal output. Um, you can notice that we have an array here with different uh, color temperatures of LEDs. Interestingly enough, at the outer settings, all the LEDs are active at all times. Once we go through the Kelvin range, we see that they're always active. Uh, which is an interesting approach to this. I've not really seen this before. Um, and at this stage, you can uh, take a few lenses that go over this array uh, for different uh, beam spreads. Normally speaking, without anything on it, it's about 120 degrees, but they have a 60 degree beam angle uh, lens spreader, uh, as well as a 30 degree one. So I'm gonna show you that now. If you're unfamiliar with them, it's a little bit searching to find out what they are. Um, it does say on the top right corner, in this case, this is the 60 degree and uh, full beam angle. Um, it clicks in nicely. There are a few notches on the top side of the plate, which you can move in like so, and just pull it in. Even with uh, this uh, lens plate uh, attached to the light source, you do still get multiple shading, as you would expect from a ray type like this. The interesting thing about this multiple shading is that it's very distracting when you see it on the background. But if you're really in a pinch and you take a look at our model, you'll see that it's not really that pronounced. So if you have to 
uh, and you don't have any other option, uh, I think you could use this as a direct light, but preferably you would always use this through some kind of diffusion to really soften this. Um, they do supply a diffuser, um, and I think it's only moderately effective at softening the shadows. You see as I drop it in, it doesn't really do that much. Um, still, it's a nice touch uh, to include it, uh, if only for the protection of the lens plate uh, as well as the LEDs. So you'll notice if the plate that they have a small hole in the middle, uh, and that's for this tiny little screw here. I think this is an M6 screw. Um, and you're supposed to insert this uh, if and only if you want to use this as an overhead light. So apparently they were worried that this would fall off uh, on top of the actors uh, or models that are underneath the light. Um, though the need for this type of securing uh, lock is very understandable, um, I do feel that there is a better solution for this. Uh, of course, it's not that much of an effort to pull it out, but somehow I feel that in the next iteration we'll have a more elegant solution for this. Even though this is a passively cooled LED, it's not a completely silent LED. Once you start dimming down from 100%, there is a very small but audible hissing noise coming from the fixture. I don't think it is really going to matter uh, in normal everyday use, um, but if you are expecting a completely silent LED, this is not the case. Uh, that being said, the pitch changes ever so slightly once you dim down. Uh, and if you go back up again to full uh, power, it's not really audible at all. So some minor quibbles notwithstanding, this really is a professional unit. And it does justify the premium price. I think that the ability to rig it in lots of places, uh, the sturdy connections and the light shaping capabilities makes it a very interesting choice. And um, I think you'll have a lot of fun with it.